All right. Welcome back, everyone. We are going to bring on now Bill Danko, uh, best-selling author. Bill, I'm going to make you a host, and then we will um, go from there. Okay. There he is. Okay. <laughs> How's it going? So, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm well. We have a great audience. Um, um, you have quite the fan base. I'll tell you what, everyone that I, I now work with or talk to is, uh, they, you know, your, your inspiration. So it's great to have you and for you to spend a half an hour of your, of your time giving us some lessons. Yeah, no, I'm glad to be here. You know, it, you know, Tom, uh, let's see, you and uh, Michael Zuber. Yeah had me on a show uh, last year, I think. And that was um, a start of a wonderful relationship. So yes. uh, I thank you for this opportunity. And now I get to see the, uh, <laughs> the acts of uh, Mitch Flax and uh, uh, Matt Owens. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of um, the research that we did for the millionaire next door. And of course we always have to there, get that into the frame, right? Right. The, um, it's that entrepreneurial zeal. But you know what? Let me share with you uh, from the August 21st Wall Street Journal, an obituary for uh, Wayne Hughes. He was the founder of American Homes for Rent. And in 1972, he took $50,000 and bought his first storage facility near San Diego. At the time of his death, Forbes estimates his fortune was $4.1 billion. He owned, or his company owned, 54,785 single family homes in 22 states. Yeah. So it can start with a very modest investment. And the longevity that uh, Wayne Hughes had, you know, certainly attests to that. So I'm expecting uh, big things from uh, you and Zuber and the okay. well, <laughs> Owens well, and actually, Flax. I mean, one, right? I <laughs> you know, one, I appreciate that. But what do you, in your research, what do you think that is? Is it just this entrepreneurial spirit that drives people to achieve the best of the best? Or what, what is that that makes someone go from one small investment to worth $4 yeah. billion? Dollars? Yeah. It's, you know, he was, uh, he actually started in um, real estate in 1957, but just was kind of plodding along. And then when he was driving in California, he said, look at these pretty crummy looking storage facilities. I can do better than this. So he saw a need. And in fact, that's the, that's the headline of, of the obituary. Entrepreneur cashed in on America's clutter. <laughs> so he saw a need and he filled it. Yep. It's as simple as that. And isn't that what marketing is all about? You find an unmet need and you satisfy it. And that's exactly what he did. So, so yeah. I, I applaud him. But now, you know, he died a billionaire and that's wonderful. Huge success. But for the ordinary mortals like us, the question I want to ask is how much is enough? How much is enough? You know, oh, and that's an empirical question. When I asked people, what is your current net worth and how much do you think you need to feel rich? Well, based on the data, if your current net worth, net worth is $500,000, the average answer is you need 2.5 million to feel rich. If you already have 2.5 million, you think you need twice that or 5 million to feel rich. If you have 5 million, you think you need 8 million to feel rich. Now look, um, those are pretty lofty numbers. When we look at the, the internal revenue service data as to what does it take to be a one percenter in the United States right now, it's $11 million is the bottom of the threshold, the, the least you need to be a one percenter. The median net worth in America right now is about 
dollars per household. <laughs> so if you have a million dollars, you basically have eight times more than your average household, right? So if you look at the graph of what I just talked about, it bottoms out at about $5 million. So you're basically satisfied as that being a target. If you had a net worth of 5 million, you're doing way okay. You're in the top 3% of the net worth distribution. And you know, and I know Matt was talking about, well, what about getting $50,000 a month in cash flow? Well, you know, $550,000 a year is the minimum you need need to be a one percenter in terms of adjusted gross income. So mm -hmm. we're talking about pretty lofty numbers about, yes, wouldn't it be wonderful to make a million dollars a month, I suppose, but is it realistic yeah. you know, to be that one percenter, to be in the top 10 percent, one and a half million dollars net worth will get you there. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. I mean, I would say too, um, you know, I've, I've with that perspective. Oh, yeah, sorry. I think our videos are, um, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, um, I once had a conversation with, with my father. Um, he, he saw my ambitions and he was like, Tom, it's, it's great that you're doing all this work, but what's the number where it's enough for you? Yeah. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, you know, the old uh, saying is I have all, all the money I need if I die today. Right. <laughs> so no matter what it is. <laughs> so but let's assume we're going to live and going for that five million dollars has a reasonable I made it type uh, uh, perspective. And on a worldwide basis, of course, you know, you're in the stratosphere if you had $5 million, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's so anyway, so yeah. how much is enough, I would say 5 million for most mortals is enough to say mm -hmm. that's a reasonable goal to shoot for. Now, when I look at how the millionaire next door came about, and you know, the, the research really came together in 1993. And 20 years prior to that, I was a student in Tom Stanley's um, consumer behavior class at the university. But over that 20 year period from 1973 to 1993, we had done dozens of academic papers, consulting studies, collected large scale data sets. We had IRS data, um, uh, Census Bureau data, and what we did then in 1993 was another massive nationwide survey that we underwrote ourselves. So we didn't have to be beholden to the university or anybody. <laughs> and I was a mere assistant professor at the time. And Tom had since left to go to teach at another school. I had a young family, but he said, Bill, this is going to be big. The concept is big hat, no cattle. And the concept was a big hat, no cattle. It's about people who have the illusion of wealth, but really have no substance. Okay. So you can either be a millionaire or look like a millionaire. And one of the confessions that I heard, I think from uh, uh, Zuber at least, that he was an under accumulator of wealth in his youth. <laughs> and it is so easy in a Western society that we find ourselves in to be an under accumulator because you see your friends with these fancy cars and big houses and, you know, <laughs> leading a, a very nice lifestyle. And you want to know, can I do that? Well, again, let's look at the empirical data. The empirical data shows that for every wealthy person who can actually afford one of those high-end items, there are four to five wannabes buying the same item because they want to look wealthy. <laughs> well, you can either be wealthy or look wealthy. And having the actual wealth allows you, and I, and I know that you know, Matt Owens alluded to this, he says, what is wealth? It really is about being free and not having to worry. Well, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> worry, I'm sure, in his enterprise that, that, he's, that he has here. But the idea of, am I doing the things that are going to let me live the life that I want to live? That is what the real freedom is, right?
When you get on the economic treadmill and you have no choice but to keep working to pay all your debts, to keep up a lifestyle that you can't afford otherwise, uh, you're not free. You're in a cage, a gilded cage maybe. <laughs> but this brings us to a lesson that is timeless. From 1985, the Nobel laureate, Franco Medigliani, won his prize for the life cycle of money concept. And in a sense, what he says in the life cycle of money, when you're young, you work for money. And when you're old, money works for you. Mm. It's a simple, and you get a Nobel prize for that. Amazing. But there's a little more to his theory than that. But it's a, but it's a concept that makes so much sense. But what has happened in our society where we get, all these beautiful people doing these wonderful things and you want to emulate them and it's uh, corrosive. Yeah. But what the millionaire next door or the millionaire in your house, what they do is they have this sense of frugality and a sense of mission. They have this sense of what do I have to do to accomplish these goals and do I have to really impress anybody with the car I drive or the neighborhood I live in? Why can't I just be my own engine and do what I want to do on my own terms? And this is why we have, amazingly, so many blue-collar millionaires. I mean, we have plumbers and carpenters. And you know, one of my favorites is the bovine semen distributor. You know, they're, they have jobs that are, as Mike Rowe would talk about, dirty jobs, yeah. but somebody's got to do them. And when you have a niche and you're good at it and you can do these jobs that are not maybe socially so desirable, but they're very profitable, what's wrong with that? You're flying below the radar. What's wrong with owning storage units, right? You know, what's wrong with with just the whole real estate business that you're in. I mean, you're not surgeons. You're not, you know, rocket scientists. You don't have to be. <laughs> what you are, you have this entrepreneurial zeal. And I like that. I like it a lot. You know, in my case, I own four pieces of real estate, my house and three investment properties. And it's part of my portfolio. It's, um, and in fact, what we know based on the empirical data the higher your net worth, the more likely you are to have investment real estate. I mean, there's there's just a real good relationship. I don't have that particular slide with me at the moment, but I know it's in my stack. You know, just makes a lot of sense that real estate is a real asset that yeah. you should trace. Well, I, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's the assets that can produce income, right? And there's the assets that also give you tax advantages and Real estate is, um, it, mm -hmm. it used to be oil investments for some time and real estate has since surpassed um, those investments. So, you know, it makes sense, right? It, you know, as you, at least from my experience, as you go up in income, you, you focus more on the tax shelters and the, the, the teams to make you essentially more wealthy in a risk adverse mm -hmm. manner. So what, what do you, what do you, you know, is there a, a journey that you have researched, uh, let's say through life, uh, of the average millionaire, do they go th through certain phases or is it just from day one, they had this hunger to be wealthy or what, how does that journey look like? You, you know, often it's the wealth is secondary. <laughs> it really is. You know, there's a 1957 essay called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. And in that essay, and it's on Google um, and, and on Amazon. He made an audio as well as a short pamphlet. But in that strangest secret, he talks about the salesperson who is just trying to make a living and looks at it as, well, just that, the money he's going to get. But he uses the metaphor about the wood-burning stove where you say to it, give me heat, then I will give you wood. <laughs> he says, look, you have to have cause and effect. You have to have a reason for building that fire and that fire will then give you the warmth that you need, but you have to be a giver before you can be a getter. And so it's this idea of saying, 
I know how to solve a problem. I mean, a surgeon knows how to solve a problem. You guys in real estate know how to solve problems. And that's exactly the value you bring to the table. You're the problem solver that adds value to the whole relationship, right? So money, you, you always say, yeah, I want to be rich. But again, what does that mean? How about let me be the best provider of services in this particular niche that I'm involved in. And then, then you are sought out as the expert who knows. And that is really a, a key lesson to be seen here. And this is why, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to have succession planning and small operations because not everybody has the zeal and focus that you have as the founder. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to surround yourself with people who are have that same hungry attitude and that you know fire in the belly. Um, it, it's so hard <laughs> because look, when you have your kids and they're brought up in the lap of luxury, because you know mom and dad are making all this money, well, the kid thinks they're entitled to this into perpetuity, right? Yeah. Which which brings up you know one of the lessons from Warren Buffett that is still true today. <laughs> is how much should you give your children? Give them enough so that they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. Yeah, let, let me let me um, interject for a second. Uh, so Andrew Carnegie, uh, his story to me is probably the most fascinating from an entrepreneurial standpoint, right? A guy who comes from nothing, Scottish guy, ends up being one of the richest industrialists of his all, all time, and then he gives it all away to schooling and learning. Um, yeah. And, whatnot. and uh, he has a quote that says, there's no better asset to give a child than poverty. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when Roberto Bonini, uh, the, the, the film producer, um, what was the name of the film that he produced, but he, he won an Oscar for it. As soon as he won it, he says, I want to thank my parents for being poor. <laughs> you know, you, you really got to be hungry. And, you know, uh, it, and this is why I think, you know, I know Tom Stanley's uh, background was blue collar. His father ran a bar. You know, my background, you know, my dad died when I was five years old. He was 38. You know, we grew up in some pretty modest, uh, uh, with some pretty modest living. But you know what? Um, the advice my mother gave me was, Bill, stay in school. And I took her pretty literally. Yeah. <laughs> literally. I never, I never left, <laughs> you know, from, from my PhD program to becoming a professor. I only left a few years ago when I became an emeritus professor. And that was because I just didn't like the way the politics of the university were proceeding. Yeah. I liked a lot of my colleagues, still keep in contact with them. But um, well, l let me ask you though. Um, I guess you know for the parents on the on the on the call today, right? Who who maybe they have wealth or maybe they don't have wealth. Um, maybe they want to know what what the, does the data show in terms of um, you know as a wealthy parent or not how best to position your child to appreciate their, the efforts of earning a dollar and really just the appreciation of the wealth journey. Yeah, right. Have them get a job in their teens. <laughs> now, truly, you know, even if it's, uh, you know, lawn raking or babysitting, but just, or, or dog walking, you know, uh, I have five grandkids and they've gotten that message <laughs> you know they they're doing jobs that are well menial for their age the oldest is 15 years of age the youngest is 10 but the point is they understand how money is made by right. well, doing a task yep. so it's just not handed to them that's right yeah i was a um at age 14 i was a dishwasher making 475 an hour and at the end of the weekend i my it'd be like 45 dollar paycheck and um i knew at 14 that that could not be it <laughs> It was, pretty, it was pretty obvious that there had to be a better way to make money. Yeah, it, no, exactly. You, it, you know, you have to do some of the unpleasant things to say, boy, I better stay in school and get a, an education that's going to allow me to add value to the, uh, to society, yep. you know? So, um, so you know, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was going to say we, we hit on the first book, but I, I do want to talk about your, your, your newer book, uh, the yeah. one that's behind you. Yeah, right, right. The, the poster there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, richer than a millionaire. Yeah. Um, you know, Millionaire Next Door came out in 1996. And 
it's 4 million copies, not three and a half. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, so uh, 4 million copies later and it's still selling and it, you know, God bless America. But the point is at that time, I became the primary caregiver to my quadriplegic brother. And I was fortunate enough to be able to keep him out of a nursing home, buy him a house, pay for his aids and all that. But at most Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, I was his personal healthcare attendant. So here I am, you know, uh, you know, the New York Times bestseller, uh, Bon Vivant, driving a Mercedes, you know, the good life, dealing with a guy who can't even scratch his nose. And okay, so let's revise the picture here. What do we really need? We need a wheelchair van, get rid of the Mercedes. What do we need? We have to start thinking about what's life all about. And is it really about the money or is it about the time and the help you can give others to help them age with dignity? And that's what I felt my mission at that time of my life was helping my brother age with dignity. And he finally died in 2015 of natural causes. Um, same year Tom Stanley died, actually. Um, but I was with another colleague, Richard Van Ness, uh, who lives near me here in upstate New York, uh, another academician. We were talking about what kind of legacy do we want to give our children and our grandchildren? And that's how the richer than a millionaire came about, saying, look, it's not about money. Rich Van Ness is about 10 years older than I. He's a Marine He's focused. <laughs> he, you know, he has uh, some good attributes to, uh, to to get this job done at our advanced age. <laughs> and um, we said, let's do another study and look at the values of life satisfaction. And we have a we draw on the work of uh, Professor Ed Diener, um, who also everybody I know is dead. He died earlier this year. <laughs> okay, but Professor Ed Diener put into the public domain a scale called subjective well-being that we use extensively in Richer Than a Millionaire. And essentially, if you score low on it, you're not happy. If you score high, you tend to be a well-adjusted individual. So we look at millionaires who are happy and those who are not happy. Well, how do they differ? The millionaires who are happy tend to be very generous with their time. They volunteer, they give money to charity. They know in their heart, they have to give it away. Like Andrew Carnegie, yep. he, he knew he had to give it away. You look at uh, you know, uh, Buffett with his pledge, you know, give at least half of it away. And the point is there's, <laughs> as they say, there are no uh, pockets and burial shrouds. You got to give it away or get taxed. Look, if, could you imagine if the, um, the exemption for uh, federal tax goes down to a million dollars as Biden is exp trying to uh, get into the legislation right now? You know, that's going to be uh, quite difficult for a lot of wealthy individuals. Yeah. Um, remember when it was zero? I think it was 2010 when George Steinbrenner died. You know, so he he paid no federal tax because he died in the right year no. <laughs> based on. So who knows what the legislation is going to do? And we know that if we shower our children with too much money, we're going to deaden their senses. We know we're not going to spend it on ourselves because we already are pretty frugal. Yeah, you live in a good house. You live, you know, have a good car, but you don't make it your your, your sole reason for living. You say, you know, I just have these things so what's the best thing to do give it away and that's where fun comes in too you know helping the lives of others and yeah. so that's what we demonstrate the happy wealthy person is a generous person yeah and so um you no know, it's you know it's great it's, it's kind of the the uh the, the opposite side of, of the first book um i think you know we have five minutes left and I, I just want to say one quick comment uh mr danko is a badass tell him amazing story all right um and then we have um the, the last five minutes, I do want to discuss, um, you know, modern times of today, you know, the last year or two, of social media and everyone's kind of focused on who knows what um, is, are there any trends that you're seeing from a data standpoint or, you know, more research that 
if you could help us all kind of realign our values and efforts of life, you know, you might want to talk about. Yeah. You know, as I said, the, the research for Millionaire Next Door started really in 1993, but 20 years before that, we had collected a lot of data. But in 1993, there was a seminal article in the literature by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the New York State Senator, quite a scholar. The article that he wrote was titled Defining Deviancy Down. And what he talked about in his article is how we have lost our standards in America. You don't have to be married to have children. You can do what you want to do. You know, we have chaos in society and it's only gotten worse since 1993. So that's a trend that I see. I've seen it play out in my lifetime. I bet you've seen it as well. Things are getting more coarse in society. And it's not healthy. Nobody even believes the FBI anymore. I mean, we have institutional breakdown. Yeah. We have the military. I mean, Afghanistan, don't even get me started on that. What a, what a botched exit. Yeah. Yeah. How can any leader say that was a good idea to do it that way? What I'm saying is, yeah, there's a downward spiral right now. And I don't know when we're going to hit bottom and go back up. But man, from a societal point of view, there's a lot of chaos out there. Yeah, well, maybe if we, um, you know, start looking outwards to help people instead of just ourselves, that might, that might be a good starting point. Yeah. Uh, right, right, right. A exactly. You know, be, be the, the, the person who is going to be positive in the societal change. Right. But right now, you know, we have a lot of isolation, you know, and also Robert Putman, a uh, Harvard sociologist, he had a book called Bowling Alone that came out about 20 years ago. It's about how we, we have lost our social cohesion. You know, nobody bowls alone. It's a group effort. You know, it's a team. You know, now we live in isolation. You know, we have too many electronic devices that we get you know, in front of our faces. We don't talk. To, we have our artificial friends on Facebook. You know, in fact, I quit Facebook a couple of months ago saying this is nuts. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So one of the trends I see is this uh, downward slope, but everybody needs a place to live. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. being in the yeah. real estate business is uh, good. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely good times. Um, so I guess one last, you know, idea or thought in, in regards to the, the, the journey of, of the millionaire that maybe you want to give us before you, uh, we head out here. The, um, you know, they don't make money a false God. They know when there's enough. Their mission is to add value. And they really, they're really into it. You know, you, you can be a, an excellent plumber. <laughs> you could be an exit, an, an excellent uh, garbage collector. I mean, there, there's a lot of money to be made in, in trash hauling. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's about having this zeal where you can make a, you know, add value, but also find it to be satisfying for your talent base. Yep. Yeah, I agreed. Um, you know, I'll just add to that, that I, I absolutely love what I do. And when that click happened, uh, it went from uh, being work to being just my passion and my enjoyment. And so you're right. And the byproduct is money, right? So 100%. exactly. That's exactly how you have to look at it. Money is the byproduct yep. from doing that excellent job. That's great. And boy, what a refreshing idea that would be if everybody got that into their heads. Yeah. <laughs> really? Hard to find though, you know, hard to find. Um, it, it is, it is, it, it is. And, you know, and it doesn't help when the government says, let's extend these uh, benefits uh, into yeah. perpetuity and give yeah. you no incentive to go back to work. Yep. I hear you on <laughs> that. Um, Bill, look, it's, it's always, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's always great. Someone like you who's done a, a, again, a plethora of research and, um, put it into a format for us to comprehend ourselves. Um, so I'm sure I'll talk to you again. I know we talk every few months and um, have a debate or some sort of conversation around some sort of wealth topic. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again. And again, for everyone out there that wants to uh, see his books, I'm going to have a follow-up email to this event. You'll get access to each of those um, to purchase. And Bill, it's been great. 
Thank you. They can get the books on Amazon as well. It's so easily. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's where they'll go. Just a click away. <laughs> awesome, Bill. Okay. Um, hey, thank you. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Hey, thank you. All right. Yep. Be well.